Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Galoostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time thanks to your generous support, shares and views with multiple uploads every week to help share the rich history of monsters, locations and mythologies of D&D. Today we're going to talk about weird animals. This is kind of a homebrew D&D tip and something I do all the time in my games, even in established published settings, for a few reasons which I will talk about, but first, very simply, what is this technique? Take a relatively normal animal, which we all know about on our planet Earth. Take another animal, something with a special ability, and give that ability to the relatively normal original animal. So for example, if you look at the Tresim of the Cormier region of the continent of Faerun on the world of Toril, this is a common house cat with the flight, winged flight ability of an owl. So what happens when you take a snake and give it the pack hunting ability of the African hunting dog? Well, you get some sort of a mental image that forms the core of what whatever stats and ecology you build for that creature. And I can assure you, not every single one of us who just heard me say that, a snake with the African hunting dog's abilities, will have had the, the same idea of what that creature is. So every time you think about something like that, you're going to come up with something which is unique and created by you from your mental image and your impression of that. It will not be the same for everybody. The general idea is that these can be natural animals that have evolved or been uh, bestowed extraordinary but non-magical abilities so that uh, they need to make some sort of a biological sense. It's even remotely possible that a shark could have the projecting sticky harpoon tongue of a chameleon. Absolutely, yes. How about some sort of a cave dwelling bird that drinks the blood like a parasite insect? Well, that's the sturge. But there are basic animal creatures in fantasy worlds that don't have an equivalent version on Earth, such as the gelatinous cube. People who live on Toril and Earth accept that these sort of creatures exist. They, they are no more spectacular than a rock oyster or finding your loaf of bread has been infested with weevils. But how about a drifting cloud of flying oysters? How about a weevil that eats glass? Perhaps it's not an elemental creature that has a taste for silicon, but a natural insect that uses a glass to build a protective shell, or a cocoon, or an egg case of some kind. How about an insect that builds an elaborate fake or fake version of some sort of creature or feature of the natural world in order to trap or take advantage of other creatures? For instance, some critter that builds a very convincing fake bird nest, but the eggs inside it are actually sealed up hives full of eggs and a young queen, ready to be swallowed by a snake or a other predator. However, the hive is highly poisonous, and the hive uses the dead animal to feed the hatching workers and the young queens, so you end up with bone pile hives and nearby fake bird nests. Combine animal names and see what pops into your head. What's a turtle dove in the D&D fantasy world? What's an ostrich snail? How do you, uh, the local woodsmen carry, why do they carry bags of fur to protect them from the tiger moss? When the local alchemist or apothecary runs out of healing potions, why do they need the player characters to go to harvest some liver eels from the hot springs protected by some highland hill country rock rungs? The players will likely have no idea what these creatures are. They'll know that rolling skill checks to recall information about these things is going to have limited success because the fantasy world is extremely diverse and some stuff is just not exciting enough to be recorded by every adventuring scholar because nobody wants to pay for an expedition to write about creatures that only live in a three square mile area, a part of a continent that is practically worthless for prospecting or farming. So nobody goes there, nobody cares what these unique individual creatures do. do. The player characters may have heard about these creatures in passing if they paid any attention to unimportant little side details. For example, when there they were at the, the, some trader, last the last curio magic shop, uh, item shop that they went to, they overheard an outlander haggling over the price with the shopkeeper who was willing to pay for the hides of some pancake moths. A few weeks later, they really wish they stopped to ask what a pancake moth is when all of their magic scrolls get eaten by these strange glowing furry caterpillars. And then, when they relate this to this loss to the local merchant, they simply said, why didn't you just put any pepper inside your scroll case? Uh, that's the that's what you do when you've got pancake moths in the area. Players can't possibly remember every little detail. You can't expect them to talk with every non-player character about every little offhand weird comment that, that, that you make as a dungeon master. So don't be afraid to, to kind of emphasize some things, sort of like a you're planting a red flag on it so the players know that just stumbling on the local knowledge 
um, will give them some advantage that they'll need later. So they'll know when a specific little tidbit of information that you give them is something which you're designing into the game and not just some offhand thing. This is like when James Bond visits Q, the spy gadget maker. In the Bond films, you know as the viewer that every single one of these gadgets is going to be used at some point in the story to follow. And there is a kind of an unspoken rule that every movie will have new gadgets. And none of the old gadgets will show up unless they're part of the scene with Q. It is a, it's a story or plot mechanic that the players will understand. When we talk, walk into a shop and they say, we need some spider silk rope to replace the lot we use, and the shopkeeper says, yes, I have some. In that same resupply, I also got these potent spider lures. And the players say, they attract spiders? And the shopkeeper says, well, yes, they're extremely potent. My basement was full of spiders. Then I got some young scrappers to go down there and clear them out a few days ago. The players might now pick up the lures then and there. They might know where to find them and where they can be uh, expecting rightfully so that at some point in the future they might need them. And if they don't pick them up right away then they'll have to race back and get them. And it might be that the shopkeeper just sold the last one. Now they have to either go and purchase it off the last customer or they need to go and find where these spider lures originally came from or who made them. And, or they cut their losses and they get by without the lures. If you have a new area on the map to fill in and are looking for something to make it memorable, by all means, make a list of creatures, include animals, plants, insects, fish, pick things that are normal and things that are incredibly, that have incredible natural abilities, something that you've read about, something you've looked up in Google or Wiki or some, you know, top five interesting creatures and just start combining them. What does an octopus sunflower do? What about woodpecker ants? How about tarantula bears? What sort of environment or terrain do these creatures prefer to live in or around? Is it uh, is a deep lake rabbit otter something that interests you? How about chimney hornet squirrels? Something that is a local pest or specialty will have a, it's certainly got some sort of local expert on them. So this particular individual knows everything there is to know about chimney hornet squirrels. And it may be very well a good subplot in your game that a disturbance to the local environment has caused the local pest or specialty to become something of a more widespread pest or an exotic invasion species. This is quite a popular trope in many stories and where you see some variation of an outbreak or plague and it'd be quite rewarding for the players to be able to track the outbreak back to its source, find the local expert and discover how to fix the situation. Becoming more widely known as heroes and problem solvers, which increases their standing, their reputation and the chances of others of influence and wealth coming to the player characters with offers for more missions, more work, more adv adventure, more problems to be solved. In a long running campaign, it's knowledge of local creatures, local customs and even specific words and phrases that the players will start to latch onto. And this is the real treasure of the game. A shared subculture among the player group, keywords for memories and tales that they can share with each other. If something is particularly amusing, they'll end up sharing that story as an amusing anecdote for years. Did the local orcs make a revolting potent cheese that the dwarves secretly loved, to the point where the dwarves would raid orc settlements in order to get it? And they had no idea how the orcs made the cheese? Well, the player characters stumbled across the orcs actually hunting down trolls and harvesting specific body parts from them in order to make this cheese of theirs. And when they told the orcs that all they, they've, already, they've all become addicted to eating troll butt cheese, they had to run for their lives. This is the sort of little ecological tidbit that brings your campaign world to life and creates legendary tales from the gaming table. You throw that some, some sort of inane hilarity at your players and they will crave your game sessions. And the techniques for making these stories are so simple, you just combine things. Haggis is a sort of a boiled sheep stomach meatloaf made in Scotland. The, and cheese is milk that is deliberately curdled, drained, pressed and cured with some sort of bacteria. Instead of a sheep stomach, let's make it troll bowels, and instead of stuffing it with meat, we fill it full of roth, roth or dwarf under cow, underdark cow milk. And why do the orcs make this cheese and the dwarfs fight to get it? Well, it's clearly a gastronomic legend, but also it functions as a minor healing potion. Now picture your injured character asking for help from the dwarven ranger who stuffs the most revolting cheese the character has ever imagined into the character's mouth with great personal reluctance I might add because this dwarf loves this cheese and now the character has to make this constitution saving throw just to chow it down. If they spit it out they don't get healed and they've just offended the dwarf quite a bit. Simple, quirky, kind of stupid and pointless idea 
but that the players will remember troll ass cheese until the day they die, I assure you. My players will never forget addictive onion dip made from dried pink ooze. And that's just a simple idea taken to a fantasy world extreme. So, all you creative geniuses, let's have some fun down in the comments section and play a little game. Some post animals, plants, insects, environments, and let's see what we can make with some interesting combinations. An insect that fires boiling liquid combined with a parrot that can only eat a really hard to get into nut that also serves as its shell protected nest. Think up some ordinary creature and some extraordinary creature, then combine the two and put them in some interesting environment. And we will build up a menagerie in the comments section that should provide loads of useful and inspiring resources for ourselves and anyone else who stumbles across this video in times to come. And this creative, helpful and passionate community will build something that is truly a wonder. Have at it. And I will possibly follow up with another video featuring the best combos you will come up with. So I challenge you. Don't forget to check out the video description text. There's links to my Patreon. I thank my patrons for all their generous support. My merchandise store, possibly soon to feature artistic representations of strange new dendry creatures that we come up with. And Patron Blades, the highly affordable subscription service, loot box style personal grooming for the discerning gamer. As always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.